invite um, our lovely practitioner, I need to give you another announcement. On Saturday, this Saturday, August 30, we will be celebrating the life of a long-standing member of our temple community, Miss Thelma Webster. Miss Webster, she made her transition recently, and we will be honoring her at a Thanksgiving service to be held here at the temple at 10 a.m. on Saturday of this week. So please come out, those of you who know her, those of you who don't know her, and give support to her friends and family. That's 10 o'clock this Saturday. Now, I would like to introduce someone who I have known for quite some time in a somewhat different capacity when she was um, the head of a financial institution in Jamaica when she made her way, um, when she re repatriated and came back home to share her talents with, with our country. Many of you do not know that, but this lady is a highly skilled um, accounting professional and um, I was very pleased when I came here and saw her because it was another, um, another face that I, I, I could recognize. So without further ado, ado, I invite you to welcome our own Sonia Brown. Good morning, friends. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks, Leon for setting the tone of the service and for your kind words, Jennifer. Friends, it's truly a wonderful morning. We've had showers of blessing and we're so grateful. And indeed, there's so much to be grateful for. And it's in that vein that my message this morning focuses on the kingdom within. Recently, I came across a story on the web called From the Heart, The Truth About Fairy Tales. And this story was written by Alan Cohen, who is a contemporary New Thought writer. In this story, he relates receiving a letter from Malaysia informing him that the deceased king of Iran wanted him to inherit his royal fortune. All he needed to do to claim the fortune would be to send money to an anonymous PO box in England to pay the lawyers who would then release the funds to him. I believe most, if not all of us, have received similar emails. He says that as he reread the email, he pondered why so many people are attracted to such ruses. And he suggests that maybe on a subconscious level, we all realize there is a realm of wealth waiting for us to claim, and that the idea that we are heirs to a great estate vibrates with us at a cellular level. <laughs> Therefore, when the email or letter arrives informing us that our hidden estate is now available, we perk up. He says, and here I quote, in a way, it's true. We are heirs to a great kingdom. Not the one the scammers are, tell, are selling us, the one Jesus referred to when he told his inquisitors, my kingdom is not of this world. End of quote. This is in keeping with what we teach here in the temple. We teach that we are heirs of the kingdom and that in truth the gift has already been given. What has prevented us from claiming the gift is that we have tended to look outside of ourselves for the kingdom, when all the time the kingdom has resided within us. Here 
prayer at the temple, we teach a form of prayer, which is sometimes referred to as affirmative prayer or spiritual mind treatment. And this form of prayer helps us to realign ourselves with spirit, the Father within. It is sometimes taught as a three-step process, sometimes as a five-step process, and sometimes as a seven-step process. Today, I will use the five-step process because the third step in the five-step process, I think, is extremely important. The five steps are recognition, unification, realization, thanksgiving, and release. In recognition, we recognize the attributes of God. Some of these attributes are light, love, joy, wisdom. Not intellectual wisdom that has been gained from years of programming and socialization. Here, I am speaking of that wisdom which comes from within. That divine wisdom that guides us unerringly. Divine wisdom, the wisdom of God. The love that is not guided by hope of reward, but the love that wells up from within us and allows us to care, to share, to understand, to empathize, and which guides us to do as we are prompted from within. That joy that needs no outer stimulation, but that joy that rises up from deep within us, we unify with these qualities, our God qualities, recognizing our unity with the one, God, and therefore our oneness with all life. When we have experienced the richness and deepening as a result of recognition and unification with the God presence, we get to a place in consciousness of realization of the truth of our being. When we live from this consciousness of realization, then we are praying without ceasing. In our teaching, we very often say, God is perfect, whole, and complete. And we are one with God. This is a statement which recognizes the wholeness and completeness of God. And as we are one with God, so are we whole and complete. When the reality of our innate perfection has been so impressed on our minds that we accept this unthinkingly, then we have reached a perfect realization of our oneness with God. Good. We have embodied the perfection which the master Jesus taught when he said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father which is in heaven is perfect. We are exhorted by the master Jesus to be as that which gave birth to, be, to us, to be whole and perfect. This is the perfection which we are to seek, the perfection which comes from within not the perfection of the outer world. In seeking the inner perfection and being one with it, all things are added unto us. The estate becomes manifest in our experience as we allow the Father within to do the work. Our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, explains it thus. Now here I quote. There is a point in the supreme moment of realization where the individual merges with the universe, but not to the loss of the individuality, where a sense of the oneness of all life so enters his being that there is no sense of otherness. It is here that the mentality performs seeming miracles because there is nothing to hinder the whole from coming through. As immense and limitless as life is, the whole of it is brought to the point of our consciousness." End of quote. This month's Science of Mind magazine has an article by Dr. Holmes in which he says, we must be lifted up. That is, 
we must realize our divine nature and relationship to the truth of God. This relationship is one of complete unity." End of quote. I believe that to do this, we must go apart. And when I say go apart, I don't necessarily mean that we must isolate ourselves from the world. What I mean is that we are to refuse to allow ourselves to be distracted by the outer appearances, the various outer opinions, refuse to take our guidance from those outer promptings and instead go within, commune with our inner nature, listen, listen to what the inner voice is telling us and act accordingly. Also in this month's Science of, Mag Science of Mind magazine, Reverend David Alexander advises, therefore live for insight, that is, Stop living for achievement, success, or status. Begin living for internal awareness of the greater good that is always trying to express through you." End of quote. I'll agree that in many cases, this is not easy. It may be simple, but it is not easy. In many instances, it takes courage to do so. And why is this? I believe a lot of the difficulty we may face in putting off the outer and taking on the inner comes from our early socialization and in what the outer world continues to tell us. From the days of our early socialization in our homes, in our schools, in our churches, we were programmed to believe that certain modes of behavior would bring us some form of reward, some good. To a large extent, we ac accept this, these teachings without even thinking about them. We accept them, accepted them as inalienable, inalienable truths. These modes of behavior, in many instances, were norms and mores handed down from generation to generation. And we were told that they would earn us respect, allow us to earn a good income, make us good breadwinners, earn a certain status in society, etc. I dare say that many of these served us well. However, in a sense, we placed our faith in these norms. They led us to have certain expectations. In a sense, we made them our gods because we believed that they wouldn't fail us. However, in truth, there is only one who cannot fail us, and that is our Father within, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. When we make it a habit to go within for all things, then the right and perfect answers come to us. We demonstrate that we are indeed heirs to the kingdom. Friends, you would have noticed that most of what I have been saying so far is an attempt to encourage us to live from within. You may ask, how do we do this in today's world? I believe we have to let spirit guide our actions in the world. Whether in the home, in the workplace, wherever. I suggest that whatever we may be doing, instead of addressing our affairs in the manner in which conventional wisdom may dictate, we address them with divine wisdom. In all things we go within and seek the guidance of the Father. In many instances, the wisdom which comes through you may tell you to act completely differently from how the outer world would suggest. It may even seem irrational. However, I suggest to you that the wisdom which comes through you is the true wisdom. And you will find that if you follow in it unerringly, it will bring about that which is for your highest good and the highest good of all those who may be affected. Also, you will find that 
all the resources required to bring about the perfect outcome will be provided in divine right order. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, King James Version. You see, friends, when you keep your eyes on the Father within, when you are divinely guided, your body of affairs is engulfed in the light of the Father. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Don't listen to what the world is telling you is your good. Listen to what your Christ nature is telling you is your good. That way you abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Alan Cohen in the book, The Healing of the Planet Earth, tells how after he had finished writing the book, The Dragon Doesn't Live Here Anymore, he had faith that the same God who gave him the book would get it published. And so he sent it off to several spiritually oriented publishers from whom he either received no response or responses which suggested that the material did not fit in with their publishing plans. He says, and here I quote, one publisher whom I telephoned directly asked me what was the theme of the book. When I told him the healing power of true forgiveness, he scoffed. Now, nobody's interested in that. Try writing something more dynamic. No room at the inn. End of quote. He said the day he finished writing the book, two friends, one of whom was his mother, approached him and offered him the money to publish the book without his asking them. The conversation between him and his mother was really amusing. This is how he relates it. When I told her that I had written a book, she asked me, what's it about? I told her truth, love, and God. That's beyond me, was her immediate response. How long is it, was her next question. About 400 pages, mom. You're crazy, was her second response. The next day, her third response came. If you want the money to publish your book, I'll give it to you. I guess it wasn't beyond her, end of quote. Mr. Cohen says he found a reputable publisher to do the printing and went to New York to meet with their agent. He handed him a check for $5,000 to print the book. And as they concluded the arrangements, the agent walked him to the door and said, you know, they say you don't make any money until you've published your third book. <laughs> Mr. Cohen said he was momentarily taken aback. And here I quote, yet, I knew that I could not afford to give one moment's acknowledgement to this debilitating idea. Immediately into my mind arose the Course in Miracles lesson. I am under no laws but God's. I knew that I had to make a stand for truth. I thought for a moment, smiled at my skeptical friend, and told him, yes, Keith, I understand that. I understand that's what they may say. But one thing you may not realize is that my agent is God. I realize that I would have to trust God and believe in myself, even when those around me were lost in fear and limitation. I understood that the only source to whom I can turn in times of outer darkness is the light within me, ever urging me to know myself to be magnificent, beautiful, and good. I found myself, end of good. Friends, we have to stand firm in truth. 
We have to make God our agent in all things. Yes, like Mr. Cohen's mother initially did, the outer world may think we are crazy. Our friends, our family, our peers may think we have gone stark staring mad. But we have to stand firm in truth. Just like Mr. Cohen, there may be times when we are momentarily shaken. But at these times, we have to be even more diligent in keeping the high watch. Mr. Cohen says that the first printing of the book sold out quickly. And before long, his original investment was recouped. He says, and here I quote, soon I began to make money on its sales before my third book. What the agent had told me was simply not true. If I had believed him or allowed that limiting thought into my mind, I might have created that negative situation, not by virtue of its truth, but by the power of my thinking and believing that it was so. But because I refused to agree with that constricting idea, I experienced no limitation. There is no limitation as we rise as our ability to create with God Miracles happen, end of quote. I believe that each one of us in some way is seeking our good. We may not even be conscious that we are seeking our good. But as we go along life's pathway, there are certain desires we have which we believe will be beneficial for us. So in essence, we are seeking something that we believe will bring us good. Emma Curtis Hopkins, who has been described as a teacher of teachers, and who was one of those persons who influenced our founder, Ernest Holmes, tells us in the book, Scientific Christian Mental Practice, the following, here I quote, the unconscious truth is that there is good for me and I ought to have it. Nothing can kill that unconscious feeling. It is indestructible, it is omnipotent, end of quote. She goes on. When you look at a drunkard or miser, you will say he is seeking his good. His heart will be better satisfied the instant you speak out what his unspoken instinct is feeling, end of quote. His unspoken instinct is that there is good for him. You see, friends, Many of us, like the drunkard and the miser, are seeking our good outside of ourselves. The drunkard is looking to strong drink to fill a need, and the miser to hoard in money, also to fill a need. But the truth is that the source of our good is right within us. It is the Father in heaven that doeth the work, and heaven is within. Therefore, where we should go to realize our good is within our own being. When we do this, we unify with the source of all good and we have signs following. Joel Goldsmith in The Art of Spiritual Living, speaking of the Master Jesus says, he brought this higher way of living to them, but he also told them in so many words that they could not add to a vessel already full. They could not take this new dispensation, this new teaching that he was about to give them and add it to their old human way of living. They must die daily to that. They must empty out their consciousness of materialism and be reborn, reborn end of good. So must we, friends. We have to clear the clutter from our consciousness. As we consistently affirm truth, as we go into prayer with a receptive attitude, to hear the inner promptings, and to be at one with the source of all life, as we meditate, we gradually clear out the clutter. We die daily to the old programming, and we are renewed by the transformation of our minds. We allow God to work through us unimpeded, fully, freely, and we see the signs following. We give thanks, we let go, 
and we let God. Namaste.